And during that soundbite, Fred McGriff grounded out a nice play by Glenn Davis. You see Bobby Cox, the Braves manager, and David Justice coming up. We were talking earlier about Rule 5B and the player's contract, and we mentioned the fact that there are certain things players cannot do. The player agrees he will not engage in professional boxing or wrestling, and that, except with the written consent of the club, he will not engage in skiing, auto racing, motorcycle racing, skydiving, or any other game of exhibition football or soccer. This one drilled the left field and dropped by Jeff McKnight. So it's going to be an error on Jeff McKnight as David Justice pulls into second base. 2-0 Braves. Now, we talk about it a lot, Rob. Nothing is routine down here in spring training, and that ball could have gotten in the sun, not making any excuses, just explaining the elements. It's a high sky and difficult because of the wind conditions, although this is one of the best days the Mets have had. The wind has been blowing yeah. very strongly over the previous game. It was interesting what you just read as we see Terry Pendleton step up. Justice at second, two out, two nothing Braves, and now an appeal to first. And first base umpire Mark Barron said that Justice did step on the bag. But you mentioned motorcycle racing. Now, was Gant racing on his dirt bike or was he riding his dirt bike? I don't believe he was in an official race, but I guess the lawyers are going to have to weed that out and, and de determine uh, the language of the contract because in all probability the players union will file a grievance on this uh, case involving Ron Gant and his release are the waivers asked by John Charles and the Atlanta Braves before the game. Well it involves several several million dollars. There's another little part of this uh, agreement. It says engage in any other sport involving a substantial risk of personal injury. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's in, in other words, engaging in, in a, in other words, so the contract could be voided. Tangelosi on a diving play. How about that? McKnight drops it routinely, and Tangelosi with a sparkling play to end the inning. Well, we'll continue to talk about Ron Gant, the Mets, the Braves, and baseball after this from Coca-Cola. Backup shortstop. Well, they saw how good his teaching technique was with me at third and released Bobby. <laughs> He's still not happy about it, as you can see. Three and two now to Jeff McKnight. Bobby, a very astute baseball man, was a the go-ahead scout for the Atlanta Braves when Dallas Green took over last year as McKnight will walk. First base runner for the Mets, McKnight aboard, and Todd Hunley coming up. And Bobby Cox loved Bobby Wine and uh, had him as the go-ahead scout, scouting the teams that the Braves are going to play. There's Bobby. And when Dallas Green took over because of Dallas Green and Bobby Wine used to room together with the Phillies, and he asked Bobby Wine to be his bench coach. So Wine went from the Braves to the Phillies. Hunley hitting about that this spring, 235, with one home run. High to Hunley, ball one. Todd, the son, of course, the former Major League catcher, Randy Hunley. There goes McKnight and the hit and run. Hunley fouls it back, one and one. Speaking of uh, families and sibling pairings today, Greg Maddox throwing the first pitch of the game, and his brother Mike may be throwing the last pitch of the game for the Mets. Greg, the younger brother of Mike, they live about 20 minutes apart in Las Vegas, Nevada. Attended a lot of minor league hockey games together this spring, or this winter. And Greg will be driving up to Fort St. Lucie tomorrow when Mike and his wife celebrate the third birthday of Makala. Actually, her name is Makala, M-A-K-A-Y-L-A, the daughter 
of Mike and his wife. So Michaela Maddox will be celebrating her third birthday tomorrow, and Uncle Greg will be driving up from West Palm. He pitched against his brother when they were both rookies in baseball, the first time they ever had brothers that were rookies face each other. Nice play by Fred McGriff on the low throw from Maddox. Greg incidentally won that ball game against Mike. That was a good play at first base by McGriff. Yeah, it could have been it could have been an error on Maddox. Watch this play by Fred McGriff. That's tough to handle right there. That's that vicious half hop. Two balls, a strike. Hit hard to right and a base hit. So the first hit of the game for the Mets. McKnight stops at second. So the Mets with a thread here, first and second, and nobody out in the second, trailing two nothing. Take a look at the strong Atlanta pitching staff. Clearly the best staff in baseball, and that's just the starters. That's just the start of it, Ralph. That's a big start right there, though. Outstanding pitching for Atlanta. And uh, look at those innings pitched by this ball club. Maddox led the league in innings pitched, also an earned run average, and was a Cy Young Award winner for the second consecutive year. Glavin has been a Cy Young Award winner. back the last three years the Braves have the last three Cy Young Award winners Tommy Glavitt in 91 Greg Maddox in 92 and 93 first pitch is low nice play by the ex Mets Charlie O'Brien one and nothing now to Tim Bogart Maddox one of two to ever win the Cy Young for two different ball clubs the other was Gaylord Perry Gaylord did it with San Francisco in 72 and 78 with the Cleveland Indians. Bogard did not go. It's two balls and no strikes to Tim. Mike Cubbage down at third. Good breaking ball right there. And Bogard appeared to hold up. base hit. McKnight will try to score. Sanders does not have a strong arm. McKnight scores. Sanders goes to second with the ball. And Hunley scrambles back as Bogart, scrambling for some offense, drives in his fourth run of the spring. Two to one now, Braves on top. Deion Sanders in center field actually makes a bad play right here as he throws back of the runner. But it didn't cost him anything. Throw should have gone into third base or to the cutoff man in front of the third base. And he throws behind the runner. And a good play by Blouser to save him some problems. So it's a two to one ball game. The second hit for the Mets, second consecutive single as Rick Parker, the right fielder, takes ball one from Maddox. And again, an example of a guy falling behind in the count. Regardless of your stuff, you're going to get speed if you ball behind in the count highly uncharacteristic of Greg Maddox who walked only 52 in his 265 innings last year less than two a game doing nothing now to Parker All of those signs mean nothing. This is a pick your pitch and hammer it. Tap toward third. Pendleton to Lemke to first and not in time. Nice takeout slide by Tim Bogar. So the Mets now with runners at first and third and one out. And John Cangelosi coming up. Pendleton has to wait just a little bit to take that hop. That cost him any chance of getting the double play. I don't think anybody in the National League turns the double play better than Mark Lemke. The, the, the guy who's closest to Lemke, in my, in my judgment, is Robbie Thompson of the Giants. 
Uh, no, not Ryan Sandberg. Ryan Sandberg, if he has one fault, it's turning the double play. He's good. He's not nearly as good as Lemkin Thompson. That's the fellow you think of is Bill Mazeroski at turning the double play. The Pittsburgh Pirates second baseman. He was outstanding. Cooley and Javier, just as good. If not better, because you couldn't take Javier out of the play. His nickname, the Phantom. Disappeared on you. The neighborhood play, as you say, second base. Just be in the neighborhood of the bag, that's all. Those were numbers at Toledo for Cangelosi last year. He was released from the Detroit Tigers system, trying to make it with the Mets. Ground ball towards second. Lemke to short with Blauser, and Cangelosi safe at first. On the play, Hunley scores. It's a tie ball game. Well, the first base umpire, Mark Barron, making the call here. It appeared the throw was there in time, but the throw evidently wasn't. So it's a RBI for Cangelosi, his second of the spring training. He's having a good year in this spring training. Tap toward the second base, an easy play for Lemke. He tosses out Shurik, but the Mets tie it in the second. And in the middle of the second, we'll be back after this from Nobody Beats the Whiz. Did making a runner get down on an attempted double play. What does that mean? Well, just watch Jeff Blauser, a guy who normally throws on the top. Watch what he does with Rick Parker coming barreling into him. By going down underhanded, you get that runner to slide because he doesn't want to get his head taken off and uh -huh. it clears the throw to first base. That, uh, that is uh, a no-nonsense throw. That'll get that, uh, that runner down in a hurry as Lemke leads it off for the Braves and Mark takes ball one after taking strike one, one and one to Mark Lemke. Low, ball two. Two balls and a strike. The Braves with two in the first. The Mets tied it with two in the second. <laughs> Popped up, foul territory, and Davis gave chase, but not enough hang time for Glenn to get under it. So it's two and two to Mark Lemke. And that's uh, as much as anything, Ralph, as the spring training scene with the fans out of their seats hanging over the cyclone fences, the padding on the cyclone fences, actually onto the field of play. Uh, the umpire is very liberal. Uh, that looks like a uh, jacuzzi. <laughs> they, that's what it is. Too. Is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. And uh, the fans get in there and uh, they use it. They have used it. Let's oh, like but that. in the, in the uh, during the minor league games, when the minor yeah. league games are going on. How about that? Not a bad deal. As long as the uh, manager doesn't look down there and see one of his pitches. <laughs> I've got to say, the game. It might, uh, might be another way to uh, have fun in the bullpen. Well, let me count the ways. It's Charlie, Charlie O'Brien is the batter. Those are numbers for the Mets last year, signing with the Braves as a free agent. Mets have two members on the Braves this year that was there last year Dave Gallagher the other one hi to O'Brien two balls and no strikes to Charlie and the Mets signed the line of catcher Greg Olson so yeah Greg Olson now back with the Mets he has started his career in the Mets organization there's Dave Gallagher who is one of the outfielders and a chance to play for the Atlanta Braves Matter of fact, uh, more playing time with Dave now that Ron Gann is down because the one flaw in uh, a team with the best personnel in baseball, in my judgment, the one flaw is their vulnerability to left-handed pitching. That's why Gamp was so valuable. This one hit to left field. McKnight is over. One hand, it's two out. on Shurik for the spring. Giving 
giving up two earned runs coming into this game, and he gave up two earned runs as the first two batters scored. And he'll face Greg Maddox, who is, like Shurik, a good hitting pitcher. Rips it foul. That's uh, one of the shortcomings of spring training. <laughs> that you're so close to the field and the action that uh, the liners get on top of you in a hurry. And his day is made. I don't know if that's too chivalrous of him. It hit his girlfriend or his wife or the lady sitting next to him, and uh, he kept the ball. What's that all about? I don't think that'll last. There'll be a compromise in there somewhere. Right field line, Barris is over, and now Parker is in to make the catch. Four in a row now, retired by Shurik. Still a tie ball game. We go to the third after this from Honda. Well, a glorious day here in West Palm Beach. This stadium holds about 7,000 or so. West Palm with an entry into the Florida State League. Port St. Lucie also an entry. That's about oh, an hour north of here, but only about 10 minutes from Ralph Kiner's condo down here on PGA Boulevard. Right down 95, but everything's right down 95, Everything. wherever you go. Either the Turnpike <laughs> or 95. Yeah. Right? They run parallel to one another here in South Florida. Hulvio Veras, who grounded to short his first at bat, will be the batter, and he wanted to bunt. He takes outside corner, strike one. Mets feeling on this young man is that he is going to be a big league player. It's just a matter of uh, when it's going to be. Their preference is to send him to Norfolk, the AAA affiliate, Dallas Green trying not to rush Kilvio. He's only 23 years old from Santa Domingo. This one tapped back to Maddox, and he'll have to hurry, even though it's routine, out at first on a brilliant play again by Fred McGriff, who has saved Maddox two errors so far today. And that's unusual. Maddox, the best fielding pitch in the National League. And when he pitches with that sinker ball and changeup that he throws, he gets an awful lot of ground balls. He got one here. It took a little bit of time and almost cost him, and McGriff saves him as that ball is picked out of the dirt. And Barrett running hard all the way. He made it close. What would normally be a routine play is Fernando Vina, the batter. Vina grounded the second at first at bat. He takes ball one upstairs. Low with the changeup, two balls and no strikes. You mentioned Maddox, a, an excellent fielder, and he is, but he led the league with seven errors, and he's such a good fielder that he still won the gold glove. He has won four gold gloves. And this one is high. He can't find the plate today, falling behind all over the place, three and oh. rather unusual to win the gold glove and commit that many errors, but you've got to have a good reputation to do that. Well, that does count. Yeah. Plus the fact that he does accept an awful lot of chances. Yeah, he gets some more. That's a good point because he gets some more balls uh, than most pitchers do. Bunts in particular. High to Vina. So Fernando is on. That is his second walk given up by Greg Maddox. Good numbers in the spring, signing with the Braves before last season as a free agent. You may remember the courting by Gene Michael and the New York Yankees. They offered him more money, over $30 million, for four years to sign with the Yankees. And he turned it down to take a lesser sum, even though not considerably less, about right around $28 million to sign for four years with the Braves. He's a, to Glenn Davis, ball one. He's an avid golfer, and the entire starting staff of the Braves, all fine golfers, and they play just about every day that they can. The only days that they don't play 
is when they're the starting pitcher in the ball game. I think of the whole group, Lavin, Maddox, Smaltz, that Smaltz is the best of the pitchers in Avery. The Smaltz is the best player of the pitchers. Templeton near the tarp makes the catch, so TP makes the catch for the second out, two away, here in the third inning. Let's take a look at the Atlanta payroll back in 1990. Now, folks, that is escalation in salary right there. And, of course, that's all due to the progress of the Atlanta Braves from last to first. And, of course, when you finish in first place, the salaries go up because you have those players making that great money off a great season. So they're up to the 44.8 million mark. payroll in baseball the Toronto Blue Jays and theirs may escalate if they make the deal that everybody's been talking about for Brett Saberhagen a couple of minor league prospects that the Blue Jays have to offer the Mets Brett by the way pitching at Port St. Lucie the Mets playing two games today one here in West Palm and the other this evening at Port St. Lucie and Brett Saberhagen will be the starter it's hard to get seats when Saberhagen is pitching because the scouts come flocking by to take a look at him. They want to know if that arm is still sound. He's won only 10 games for the Mets over the past two years, but he's a Cy Young Award winner, and he has outstanding stuff. O'Brien will throw and get Vina on a perfect strike. Fine throw by O'Brien into the third for the Mets. We are tied at two, and we'll be back after this from Chrysler. right now and during business hours you can call 718-507-TIXX that's 718-507-TIXX and come see the Mets and the Cubs play and get a 1969 pin a commemorative item about the 1969 Miracle Mets 25th anniversary of the 69 Mets this year of course During that year, Deion Sanders was one year old. He'll lead it off here in the third inning of a 2-2 ball game. There's a strike to Sanders with the curveball. Good breaking ball there. Nothing at two now to Deion Sanders. This ball is breaking out of the strike zone, but Sanders starting early with his swing, commits himself, can't hold up. And no chance. Outside, ball one. One ball, two strikes to Sanders. Braves with two in the first, the Mets tied it with two in the second, we're in the third. Third ball, ground ball, Davis takes it himself for the first out. Shuri getting away with a hanger then, and that is the one thing that Greg Pavlik, the new pitching coach for the Mets, is telling me before the game, the one thing that they're trying to get Shurik away from is that lazy breaking ball of a left-handed batter. Left-hander, there's Greg Pavlik. Left-hander batted 313 last year against Shurik. And when that happens, something's wrong. Of all of the combinations, a left-handed hitter cannot hit over 300 against a left-handed pitcher. There are a few, a few of them around, but when you give up that kind of average to left-handers and you're a left-handed pitcher, well, things are not, you got to change something. Yeah, something's wrong. One and one to Blouser, who tripled in a run in the second inning. Inside, ball two. Remember back in 1990, they were talking about trading Blouser for Roberto Kelly. That trade never came off. The Yankees and Atlanta Braves. 
Hit hard to left off the glove of the diving Bogar. But Blauser has his second hit of the afternoon. So Blauser, the one-out base runner, and Chipper Jones, the batter. Jones with an RBI ground out in the first. This ball is very sharply. Good job by Bogart to get his glove on it, but it's right off the tip of it. Blauser now with both hits for the Atlanta Braves, a triple and a single. So that was the curveball as Jones was fooled on the pitch, but Ralphie kept his bat back. You still have your hand. He was drafted number one in the nation, and this is his first real experience at the possibility of making a major league ball club. He's had outstanding minor league years. You see that he moves off the curveball, but because he was good in good hitting position, he's able to get enough on it. It hit it hard enough in the hole for the base hit. He's an outstanding talent. 325 last year at Richmond, the AAA affiliate of the Braves. 13 home runs and 89 RBI. And once again, irrevocable waivers asked on Ron Gant, the left fielder of the Braves that would broke his leg in two places. Automobile or a uh, dirt bike accident during the offseason. One and nothing to a man who chooses his words very carefully, Fred McGriff, a very quiet guy. Throw to second is high. Could have had a shot at Blauser dancing off of second base, but the throw was high and Blauser's in there. Getting back to Gant, as we look at this play again, a bad throw as Mania comes over to take it, saves an error as he knocks that ball down. By going on waivers, a club could claim Ron Gant, but they would have to pay his full salary. He has just this year remaining on his contract, so they'd have to know that he was going to sign again with that club for them to pick him up. They don't expect him back in action if he can get back that soon until June or possibly July with that broken leg. Yeah, well, talking around today before the game, since it was such a big story in baseball, not only with the Braves, because of the ramifications that are gonna, a lot of people feel are going to happen from the Players Association. But it's the type of injury, it's like a football injury, from what I understand, is that once you heal, with that type of break, it was uh, his right leg broken in two places. And once it does heal, you will never be completely 100%. And time is called. Crowd calls balk, but the umpire calls time. Still one and one to McGriff. Yeah, at one time a fine runner. He had 34 solo bases in 91. He had. 32 stolen bases in 92. Last year he had 26. And of course he has that outstanding power. 91 he had 32 home runs. Drove in 105 runs. Outside, ball two, two and one. We understand that a, a one inch rod was put through the, make that a half inch rod, was put through the tibia of Ron Gant's leg. One would assume that uh, that'll stay in there. Even though I guess they can remove those things once uh, once the bone heals. Oh, hit hard to second, but a routine double play ball. Fred McGriff has hit two balls hard with nothing to show for it. Still two to two. We're back after this from Coca-Cola. Training. Ralph, uh, prior to coming into the fourth inning, talking about his golf game along with Jeff Mitchell, and here's uh, Ralph to talk <laughs> about some baseball. <laughs> okay, back to the ball game. It's 2-2. The Mets and Braves were in the top of the fourth inning. Jeff McKnight will lead it off for the Mets. McKnight with 19 pinch hits last year, and second to Rusty Stop for the most pinch hits in one season by a Mets player. Stop with 24. A 
On the mound, Greg Maddox, Cy Young Award winner for the second consecutive year. And the count now, ball two, two balls and no strikes. Not too many pitchers have won the Cy Young two consecutive years. And the ones that have done it have been great ones. Sandy Koufax, McLean, Koufax, of course, well known, and Danny McLean back in 68 and 69 was a back to back winner of the Cy Young. Jim Palmer in 75 and 76. Roger Clemens in 86 and 87. Ground ball to McGriff, who bobbles it, but he has plenty of time. Makes the throw to Maddox, covering it first for the out. One away here in the fourth. One of the interesting things about that list, Ralph, is that Sandy Koufax won the back-to-back -back Cy Young Awards in 65 and 66. Those were years in which only one was given. As McGriff, after the bobble, throws to Maddox. One taking in both legs, and Kopak doing it the hard way there. Of course, now they give a Cy Young to a pitcher in the National League and the American League. That started back in 1967, as a matter of fact, the last year that Sandy Kopak pitched for the Dodgers. And now Todd Hundley, the batter. Todd singled his first time up. First time up to take the strike. One and one the count. Gaylord Perry, the only pitcher to win the Cy Young in both leagues, National League and the American League. And that fastball way high. Maddox having problems with his command of his pitches. He has got some sort of arm. Two balls, two strikes. Maddox winning the Cy Young Award with the Cubs and then with Atlanta. Two and two the count. Tie, tie game at two and Maddox back to Todd Hundley. And it's ball three. Full count to Hundley with Tim Bogar on deck. Mets this spring with a record of eight and five. The Braves have won six and lost five. And the Mets had a spring where they won seven in a row. Foul tip and out of the glove of Charlie O'Brien. O'Brien throwing out a runner attempting to steal in the third inning. Of course, he caught for the Mets, and he is an outstanding drawing catcher. Averaging over 38% of the runners caught stealing. Very high percentage. Hard, cold foul. Well, Hundley, who does that in the course of the season many, many times, pulls it foul, although he hit it hard. And that is caused because of lack of bat control. Amazing how many people like to see the ball hit hard foul. But it counts for nothing. And the pitchers love it. This one grounded to the first base side, and the grip takes it all by himself. Well, a lot of it has to do with the location of the pitch, too. A lot of times with two strikes, if the pitch is way inside and you're trying to protect the plate, or if it's uh, way outside and you're trying to protect the plate, have a defensive swing for it. If it's off the plate, you really can't tell. How far outside? Here's that ball he hit foul. We'll see how far in off the plate it was. No, not that far. Oh, over the inside part of the plate, and he's out in front and pulls it out. You don't adjust your hands in time to get your hands far enough out in front to keep it in fair territory. Now the batter is Tim Bogar, and he has single in his one appearance. Tim having a good year. Came into this game hitting 313 this spring. One and two. ball is fouled, so the count remains at one ball and two strikes. Oh, 
Ogar with the Mets. Hit 244 last year. 78 ball game. And the count now two and two. Rounded to the second baseman Lemke. And the Mets go in order. The score at the end of three and a half innings. The Mets two, the Braves two, and here's the word from Nobody Beats the Wiz. It's brought to you by Nobody Beats the Wiz Home Entertainment Center. Bottom half of the fourth inning. Tie ball game at two, and Dave Justice will lead it off. Justice this spring, one for 17. But don't let that fool you. He can play on the first pitch. A breaking ball for ball one. Justice reached on an air his first time up. Ball dropped in left field, and he bounces it up the middle, and he has a base hit. Justice with 40 home runs last year, 120 RBIs, second in both departments in the National League. One of the reasons for that is his skill in hitting against left-handed pitching. It's a fastball in the middle part of the plate. Justice, for his career, is 50 points higher against left-handers than he is against right-handers. 50 highly unusual so justice on 2-2 game Terry Pendleton who lined the center was robbed of a base hit in the fine catch by Cangelosi batting for the second time and he takes for ball one Pendleton the MVP for Atlanta an off year last year hitting 272 with just 17 home runs 84 runs batted in started very slowly in his first 29 games he hit 148 last year after that he hit 299 and he too off to a slow start this spring batting 208 coming into this game but with veteran ball players spring training really is just a place to Temporarily get ready for the full season. One and one the count. Jurek working in the fourth inning now has been reached for four base hits. I think it's important to win the last week or ten days in spring training. That's when you want everybody ready for the season. Spring training when you're a veteran team, at least I did it this way. I tried to gear for the last week of the season, try to get everything working at that point. The rest of the time I use spring training to experiment, try different things. This ball hit deep to center field. It's way back. Angelosi can't get to it. It'll be off of the fence and right center. Justice on his way around third, and he comes in to score. The throw to third base, not in time. And the Braves have taken the lead on the three base hit by Terry Pendleton. Both the first run driven in by Jeff Blauser and this run to break the 2 2 tie driven in by Pendleton were triples to right center field. Angelosi can't catch up to it, Rick Parker can't get to it. Ned Yost, the third base coach, waving Justice on around and Pendleton into third base. And like back in the first inning, a runner at third with no one out after a run had scored. And the Mets are playing their infield back at short and second, in at first and third for Mark Lemke. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it here. I'd play the infield, on, especially on the right side, I'd play it in because you have the bottom part of the batting order up. And the pitch outside. And Two Charles, balls, no strike. Charlie O'Brien is on deck. He is not known for his hitting. And then Greg Maddox in the hole. While he's a good hitting pitcher, he is still a pitcher. 
Jerk back and getting the strike on the outside corner. Lemke was struck out his first time up. Shurik's only strikeout in this game. Lemke is best power year ever last year for Atlanta, but not known for much power. He had seven home runs last year and 49 runs batted in. Career high and runs batted in and home runs. And he lines it to the left for a base hit. That'll score Pendleton. And the Braves now lead it four to two as Lemke gets his first hit. Three in a row now for the Atlanta Braves and six for the game. So Lemke a run batted in on at first with no one out and Charlie O'Brien the batter. Charlie flying the left his first time up. Former Mets catcher. Batted 256 for the Mets last year with four home runs. And a toss to first. He was signed as a free agent by Atlanta in November. And this ground is foul. The Braves traded away their two catchers that they had last year. Greg Olson and Barry Hill. Damon Barry Hill. So O'Brien might see some action for Atlanta. Yeah, but not in not with Javi Lopez. He may he may see about as much as he saw last year. I mean the Braves didn't get him uh, to be the number one catcher. He's not a number one catcher. Never will be, never has been. Was in 67 games for the Mets last year as a backup to Hundley. Lopez, a rookie and uh, very promising. Again, it's grounded foul. Bobby Cox, the, gen the uh, manager, was the general manager of the Braves. Had uh, two artificial knees implanted this winter, actually early October, right after... The Braves lost to the Philadelphia Phillies in six games. They lost the NLCS. And the fastball for ball one, one and two. Bobby went in and had uh, knees that have been bothering him for 20 years or so. Matter of fact, that's why he had to cut his career short. He's the third baseman in the Yankee chain. Played for the Yankees back in the late 60s. And Dodgers. Pitch out, but nothing on. Talking about Lopez, the young rookie trying to make the ball club as a number one catcher. He batted 305 at Richmond last year with 17 home runs, 74 runs batted in in 100 games. He was brought up in August when Olsen was hurt. Ralph, the only way that he's not going to be the number one catcher is that if he gets hurt. He is the number one catcher right now. From Puerto Rico. Javier Lopez. Javi Lopez. Right-hand batter with good power. Voted the top catching prospect in the Southern League back in 92. And that pitcher ball. So it's a full count to Charlie O'Brien with a pitcher on deck. And action in the bullpen. For Atlanta. They may use the pinch hitter. Maddox is on deck, as you said, but uh, Anthony Telford is warming up. I think Maddox will probably hit for himself. Bobby Cox will see how he feels. You mentioned Lopez and his power. You know, the first thing that Leo Mazzoni, the pitching coach of the Braves, Bobby Cox, would tell a young catcher like that is to get the power. You, we're not interested in your offensive output. We're interested, especially when you have the types of pitchers that the Braves have. We're interested in your defense and how you can handle the pitcher. Obviously, we want you to, to hit well, but your primary responsibility is to the pitching staff and not to power or anything like that. He 
is a, a fine offensive catcher, but that's one of the problems young catchers have in breaking in is trying to earn the respect of the older, more established pitchers. So a full count as Zurich plays at first base. Lemke, the runner there. And he goes with the pitch, and it's called foul. So O'Brien, way out in front, pulls it foul, keeps the count at three and two on this sunshiny day here in Florida. This might be the best day the Mets have had all break. Uh -huh. Temperature right around 80 degrees and very little wind. And blue skies up above. Full house, the Mets against the Braves. Braves will be in the new division with the New York Mets. Runner again goes this one line to left field. A slow start and left by McKnight, but he can't even get close to it. It'll go as an extra base hit, and Lemke scores easily. So now four hits in a row off of Pete Jurek, and the Braves have taken the lead by a score. Uh, five to two with three runs in here in the fourth inning. Four straight hits for the Braves. It looked like uh, Jeff McKnight when he slid on the at cinder track in left field. Watch how he tries for the ball. His momentum carries him forward. He trips and has to try to regain his balance by putting his right hand down. Looks like he's got some cinder problems now. Turn to Cinder. And that'll bring up Greg Maddox, who flied the right his first time up. The Mets are looking for the sacrifice here. Maddox is not a bad hitting pitcher. He has led all National League pitchers in hitting, at least in base hits, in a single season. But the Mets are looking for the sacrifice. Maddox does not score. He grounds it to short. The throw goes to third. It's a bad throw and on the air. O'Brien safe at third base. So on there, tries to Vigno. Vigno, I should say, and no one is retired on the ground ball. Well, they could give him a fielder's choice on that ball, but it's clearly a high throw to Bogart at third. What happened, I think, is that the base runner running in the same line that the throw would take was in the way. Vigno thought he had to get the ball up, and he did. But uh, that's why a lot of times uh, teams encourage runners not to slide because when you slide, you clear the path for the for the fielder. And it looks like uh, at least there there's been no error right now. But I agree with you, Ralph. I think clearly that's an error instead of a fielder's choice. And now the batter is Deion Sanders, and he takes the first pitch for ball one. Sanders with a walk and a run scored also has grounded out. When you're a base runner in that situation, you try to align yourself to get in the way of that throw to the right. third baseman. Right. So you can get hit. And that's the play you're looking for. It would be similar if you're on third base and a ball were uh, hit to the third baseman, stay close to the bag. You wouldn't want to run outside the line in that situation. You'd want to run inside the line because that's the same line that the fielder has to take throwing it to the catcher. Same thing. And this ball grounded foul. Two balls and one strike. The Mets playing back for the double play. The Braves leading 5-2. to two. They're batting in the fourth inning and no one out. And they have charged an error to the shortstop on that play. Met second air in the ball game. Sanders takes the fastball and the count three and one. Pete Churik on the mound. And Sanders grabs it foul, so it's a full count now to Deion Sanders. Sanders became the first player in baseball history to simultaneously play two professional sports in a single year. Deion. 
join the Falcons for football. And base hit the left field. O'Brien scores easily. The throw goes back to second base. And Maddox back in the second safely. So Sanders gets a base hit. He now has hit in six consecutive games this spring. And he picks up his second run batted in. Greg Pavlik will talk to Pete Jurek now as Sanders fifth one to left field right off the hand. We were talking earlier about realignment with divisional play. This is the way it looked. For the first time in Major League history. First year of divisional play was back in 1969 and this will be the first year of tri-divisional play. In the American League, we will allow you to suggest this. West needing one more team to round it out. Somewhere along the line, expansion will do that. Need one more team in each league to balance it out. And now the batter is Jeff Blauser, who's two for two, a triple and a single. And Jerry falls behind him. Runners at first and second. Still no one out. Zurich struggling here in this fourth inning. We were talking before the ball game about divisional play, and I think the consensus would be that there's nothing else you can do. You have to do that with the expansion. But the big problem seems to be that you play more teams outside your own division than inside. Yeah, you definitely do. You only play 39 times in your own division, and I think that's where the inequity lies. I think uh, something should be done about getting a, a true division champion. Now it's uh, really the team that uh, has beaten the other teams, which in a sense is just as important, but it does nothing to show your superiority. It does, it, I don't think it maximizes the dominance in your own division. There are better ways to do it. Two balls, no strikes to count. And it now goes to three and all. There will be a wild card team that will get into the playoffs to make it even with four teams playing. Wild card team will be the team with the best record. And not win the and not win the division. What if you have three teams past the second? Like last year would have been interesting. With Atlanta and San Francisco in their same division winning over 100 ball games. San well, Francisco course, then, would have been in. Well, yeah, of course. That's uh, a wild card. Yeah, then it would have been. I'm, I'm talking about what if you have what if you have three teams with 98 wins and all of them finish second in their division. <laughs> no. You had to bring that up. A drive to left, well hit, but right at McKnight, and he makes the catch. So the first out of the half inning, and that was a bullet hit out the left field. I would imagine they have a contingency for that, either a tiebreaker. I don't know yet what that contingency is. But you would have to have something like that. Otherwise, you'd, uh, you'd have uh, a one-game playoff and it looks like uh, Dallas after that last pitch has said uh, that's enough for Pete today. I would think it would be first your record against the other two teams. Whoever had the best record against the other teams if they did tie. That might be the first one. But the complications What if two of those it. three teams had even records against us? Then we would go to another way. <laughs> a flip of a coin would you believe? Oh, no. no I never been. would do that. No way. So, Jurek has reached his limit of pitches, and he's reached his limit as far as the Braves are concerned, as he will leave the ball game, and the Mets will go to the bullpen for a new pitcher. Jurek will get credit for three in the third inning. And we'll be right back in just a moment, right after this word from Visa.
New pitch of the ball game as the Braves lead six to two. Doug Linton, 2-0 last year. That was with California. He was released after the season by the Angels. He originally signed with the Blue Jays, 43rd round. 43rd round. Even Mike Piazza was drafted uh, after Doug. He's one of the few guys that's drafted after a guy drafted in the 43rd round and still made it to the major league. Doug signing as a free agent with the Mets, his best year back in 1987 when he was 12 and 10 for Syracuse, the AAA affiliate for the Blue Jays. One and three with Toronto in 92, making his first major league appearance. And it's that kind of a day, fans. Sunshine all over the state of Florida. And the first pitch hammered down the right field line by Chipper Jones. That'll score one. And now coming around and scoring the second run. As the Braves continue to pound on the New York Mets here in the fourth inning. Chipper Jones with a double down the right field line. His second hit of the ball game to drive in two. RBI's number two and three for Jones. He's two for three on the afternoon. RBI and a single as a right-handed batter and as a left-hander of course he's a switch hitter and well what a good looking player he is played in the minors as a shortstop but no way he'll play here with blouser ahead of him he could be the starting left fielder for the braves against left-handed pitching who are the other guys buying for that job? Ryan Klesko, Tony Tarasco. Tarasco having a great spring, batting 387. They are a deep organization in personnel. And McGriff takes it deep to right, but it's curving foul, and it'll be a long foul ball. So McGriff, the ninth batter to bat in this inning. Takes it deep to right, but pulling the ball too far to the right. Griffin this game has hit the ball hard twice. He has grounded out to first and grounded into a double play. He's two for 25 so far this spring without a home run. And a strike ball in the outside corner. One and two. McGriff, the guy who got it going for the Atlanta Braves after he was picked up by Atlanta from the San Diego Padres. And a ball call off the fastball. Two balls and two strikes. McGriff was third in the MVP battle team behind Bonds and Dykstra. Overall, he hit 270 last year with 40 home runs. And that pitch outside. So a full count to Fred McGriff. games for Atlanta. He hit 310 with 19 home runs when he was picked up. From the San Diego Padres, he was hitting 275 with San Diego with 18 home runs. I said he had 40 home runs. He had actually 37 home runs. Three and two the count. Braves breaking it open here as they've had a big inning. And a strike three call. So Linton comes back to pick up a strikeout after giving up a hit on his first pitch coming into the game a relief of Pete Curie. It looks like a 
side door breaking ball. Yep, exactly what it is. A lot of times, whether you get that call or not depends on how smoothly the catcher catches the ball. Let the big guy, 6'3", 210 pounds, from Santa Ana, California. Lives in Kingsport, Tennessee now. And the first pitch to Dave Justice is a big swing of the miss. That's Justice one for two in this game, a single in the fourth inning. Two tied. Rounded out to the first base side, fielded by Glenn Davis. He tosses to it, and that'll do it. So five runs in, make that six runs in, and the score at the end of four, Atlanta eight, the Mets two, and here's a word from Bud Light. Here in Rochester, the AAA affiliate of the Orioles, and he signed as a minor league free agent with Atlanta. Atlanta hoping to get lightning in the bottle like they did with Greg McMichael last year. A lot of other changes too, Ralph. New first baseman is Ryan Kelso. He takes over for McGriff at first base. We have a new catcher, Javier Lopez. Man, we have been talking about who'll do the number one catching for Atlanta. In left field, we have Troy Hughes. And in center field, Kelly has got in there. Looks like Tony Tarasco in, in right field, too. I can't uh, see his number. Yeah, that's Tony. Tony Tarasco will be the right fielder. Tarasco, a guy. That, uh, Bobby Cox says, has the best throwing arm in the organization for an outfielder. So the Mets trailing by a score of 8-2 to two and batting here in the fifth inning and the first pitch by the Atlanta Brave pitcher hit in the air to center field and Rick Parker, who had grounded into a force play, is out for the second time in today's game. I'll bring up John Cangelosi. Cangelosi has grounded in their fourth play and is only a bat. And he takes the first delivery for strike one. You know, uh, that's an unusual uh, chest protector that Lopez has. He's probably uh, received a lot of foul tips on the right shoulder. But it would seem that that would Im impair his throwing uh, to the bases. It is a flap that when he raises his arm, the flap comes up. But usually you'll see a flap like that on the left shoulder, but not the right. Usually the right shoulder is cleared for that reason. They need to throw without being impeded. It's not on the left shoulder right there. It's a little thicker, a little wider on the left shoulder, but he doesn't have that extra flap there. And it's right back to Telford who picks up a quick out. Bill Cangelosi, the second out of the inning. As the Braves lead it by a score of eight to two, the Mets batting in the top of the fifth inning. And Telford with his first pitch is fouled off. Doug Linton batting for the first time. And it's 
hits it hard in the second baseman makes a fine play. Lemke with the backhand stab and the Mets go in order. So a one, two, three inning and the score at the end of four and a half innings. Atlanta eight, the Mets two, and here's a word from your tri-state Toyota dealer. Well, the Braves with six runs in the fourth inning, taking the lead by a score of eight to two, and they'll now bat here in the fifth. And as we go to the rest of the action here in the middle of the ball game, once again, Tim McCarver. All right, Ralph, you had a good look at uh, Mike Maddox, the young man with the beard on the sitting on the bench, and he is the older brother of Greg, who started this game. Greg Maddox went going four innings, giving up two runs, both of which were earned. The Mets tied it in the second, but the Braves exploding for six in the fourth. It is eight to two. Nine hits for Atlanta and two hits for New York as Doug Linton is in relief of Pete Shurick. All eight runs charged to Pete Shurick on the afternoon. Hit hard to first and through the legs of Glenn Davis. Pendleton, a big turn, will hold it first. So that will be the third error of the ball game for the Mets. Davis upset that he didn't stay down on the ball. All right, here the gate is left open and it goes right between the wickets. And Pendleton, who has one hit, is now one for three. His base hit in the fourth inning, a triple to drive in a run. Mark Lemke, the second baseman, is one for two with an RBI and a run scored. And the high fastball misses inside. Mark from Utica, New York star of World Series past, particularly 1991, when the Braves lost to the Minnesota Twins in seven games. Let's see with a remarkable World Series that year. The Braves lost in seven in 91 to the Twins. They lost in six in 92 to the Blue Jays. They lost the division, make that the pennant last year in six games to the Phillies. And still with uh, some awesome personnel. Very, very deep and talented. High with the breaking ball. It's two balls and a strike to Lemke. for Atlanta. He was not eligible for postseason play last year, but he was in 1992. 
when Atlanta played the Pittsburgh Pirates. Check swing on the breaking ball. It's nothing at one. Who could forget that 1992 National League Championship Series? One of the most exciting in postseason history. Throw to second, not in time. It's Pendleton's back. to two Atlanta on top we're in the fifth inning Tim McCarver Ralph Kiner see Todd Hundley taking the ball and pointing toward his left shoulder trying to remind Doug Lenton to keep his shoulder closed that's a similar sign that a batting instructor would give to a hitter Lopez pulling out of there on that slider. It's a ball and two strikes to Javier Lopez. is jammed, bobbled by Bogar. He'll have to go to first. It is not going to be an error, but Bogar could have turned two. So some shoddy defense by the Mets today. An error on Jeff McKnight. An error on Glenn Davis. And an error on the shortstop, Fernando Vina, and almost an error on Bogar. Well, the rule book says you can't assume a double play, but it would have been a double play if they had executed correctly. And as Tim pointed out, no air on the plays. They got it out, but the runners move up 90 feet. That'll bring up the right fielder, Tony Tarasco, with runners at second and third and one out in the infield field in all around. Fastball for a strike, nothing in one. Slider is low, ball one, one and one. This fellow right here is certainly one of the outstanding prospects. He has tremendous power. Born in New York, but he lives in Santa Monica, California. Slider catches the corner, a ball and two strikes now to Carrasco. Hard to believe that Carrasco was the 15th round draft choice. Some guys, however, mature uh, late in life, late in their adolescence. A guy like Darren Dalton of the Philadelphia Phillies weighed 160 pounds when he graduated from high school. He's a solid 200 pounder now as Carrasco goes down on strike. And there are two away here in the fifth inning. And that'll bring up Mike Kelly, the center fielder. Second strikeout for one draft choice back in 1990 off the campus of Arizona State and those were his numbers last year at Richmond no 
another check swing. Nothing and two now to Kelly. American team three of the four years at which he was attending Arizona State. That fastball just missing. One ball, two strikes down to Mike Kelly. Lynn thought it was in the strike zone, thought he had the strike out to end the inning, but Jerry Meal says no meal ticket there. Still one and two to Kelly. Two on, two outs here in the fifth. Eight to two, Atlanta. Braves are out, hit the Mets ten to two. Braves and the Mets in the same division as Philadelphia, Montreal, and Florida this year. Has to be considered the toughest division in baseball. ball got him third strikeout for Linton as the Braves go down it's eight to two Atlanta after five and we're back after this from Bud Light eight to two Braves on top of the Mets here in the sixth inning Ramon Caraballo is the new second baseman Mark Lemke out of there and over at third is Jose Oliva no relation to the great hitter for the Minnesota Twins, Tony Oliva. As the second baseman, Kilvio Veras, leads it off of the Mets here in the sixth. Kilvio, in two trips, is grounded out twice. One and one to Veras. of course signing as an undrafted free agent with the Mets he tries to bunt he fouls it off one and two and the reason uh, he was undrafted is that uh, the draft is not held for players out of the country unless it is Puerto Rico from the Dominican Republic. There are undrafted free agents that are born in mainland uh, United States or even Hawaii or, Atla or Alaska for that matter. But there are none that are drafted when they are from Santo Domingo or the Dominican Republic or Venezuela. Well, Panama. Panama, yeah. Nicaragua. So the draft was not held for those players. Barris missed, but he's out of there. One out. First strikeout for Anthony Telford as Telford has retired four in a row since entering the game in the fifth inning. Well, Telford picking up the high strike off of the breaking ball. Barris thought he had ball four and holds onto the bat and says, Gotcha. Fernando Vina takes the slider high. Ball one. Grounded foul. One and one now to Fernando, who was with the Seattle Mariners. You may have caught our broadcast a couple of weeks ago. He was with the Mariners last year until June. He was caught up in the numbers game there for Lou Pinella. They were very impressed with his play, but Seattle needed a pitcher, and Philadelphia allowed Tom Ayrault 
to leave as the high throw does not get Vini. It'll probably be a base hit. Rafael Belliard making the play. And then when Aroff went to Seattle, Vina was returned to the Mets. Sam Belliard, who lost his shortstop position to Bowser, unable to get the ball there in time, and it will be scored as an infield base hit for Vina. And the Mets get their third hit of the game. Glenn Davis now the batter. He has struck out and popped out. Fastball for a strike. We mentioned earlier about how uh, some older players prepare for the season. Well, certain older players don't prepare at all. Every at bat is meaningful, and that's the case with Glenn Davis. Trying to make the Mets after inactivity for two years with the Baltimore Orioles. One and one to Glenn Davis. Some great years for the Houston Astros, over 30 home runs. And then traded to Baltimore, and unable to really get it going. He says he wants that all put behind him. Doesn't want to talk about the days in Baltimore. Foul tip held on to by Lopez. The ball and two strikes now to Davis. Not only his days in Baltimore, but his days away from Baltimore. He went down on injury rehab down to Bowie, Maryland, the double-A affiliate of Baltimore. It's right close by there. And in protecting Randy Reddy, a teammate, uh, in a bar one night, a fellow blindsided him, broke his jaw. Randy Reddy ended up uh, with the Oakland Athletics, as a matter of fact, to end the season. And uh, Glenn Davis finished his season with a broken jaw. So uh, the years in Baltimore are indeed regrettable. Two and two now to Davis. will go to second for the one over to first double play nicely turned double play and a nice pivot by Caraballo still eight to two Graves on top we're back after this from your tri-state Toyota dealer the Atlanta Braves with six runs in the bottom of the fourth inning fell the difference in this game it's eight to two Atlanta Dallas Green trying to figure out what changes he would make if any since the Mets are on the road about an hour north of here is their training complex in Port St. Lucie Belliard leading it off here in the sixth inning fouls it down the third baseline nothing and one to Rafael Belliard Mets once again playing up Montreal this evening, so uh, a split squad game and very few extra men for Dallas Green and the Mets, so not as many changes as the, the Braves. And if the Braves were playing in Port St. Lucie, that would be the same thing with Bobby Cox. He would bring a different outfit, one and one to Belliard. Doug Linton has done a good job. He came in in the fourth inning 
His first batter face was Chipper Jones, and Jones doubled in two runs down the right field line. But since that Jones double, he has held the Braves to one hit over two innings. Good slider there to Troy Hughes, the left fielder. Outside, ball one. One and one to Hughes. When it comes to making those road trips, you know about where you stand with the manager if you have to make the long one. The stars get to stay home in most cases. of the Braves in 1989. So he's been in the farm system for five years. The slider is fouled back. He's played in such towns as Bradenton, Pulaski, Macon, Georgia, Durham, North Carolina, Greenville. Say, if you're an outfielder in this organization, you are backed up. It's that simple. Hope you can get a shot somewhere else. Well, they are loaded with talent. As Hughes grounds out, and that'll bring up Ryan Plesko, the first baseman. the batter and Klesko is the possibility for that left field job vacated by Ron Gant who was put on irrevocable waivers today before the game it's still eight to two Braves we'll be back after this from chemical colors with the Mets MasterCard from Chemical Bank. If you have one, use it. If not, call 1-800-233-METS to apply. Lawless renegade. Kill them all. Choose the wrong target on Kung Fu. Wednesday at 9 on Channel 9. 8-2 Braves here in the top of seventh inning. And a pitching change for Atlanta. Anthony Telford was the second pitcher following Greg Maddox, and now it's Bill Hill on the hill. Bill 3-0 last year with Cincinnati. Picked up on waivers by Atlanta on October 5th of last year. And in to take you through the rest of the way, here's Ralph Kiner. Bill Hill will be pitching for the Braves. He was born in Atlanta, lives in Cummings, Georgia. Cumming, actually and signed with the Cincinnati Reds originally. And he'll be working to Jeff McKnight, who is 0 for 1 with a walk and a run score. Braves leading by a score of 8 to 2. They've out hit the Mets 10 to 3. The Mets have made three errors in the ball game. The Braves have made none. Braves sending 10 to the plate in the fourth inning to score six runs and break a 2-2 tie. And McKnight lost the fly ball to left field. Troy Hughes is there, one away. And now for the Mets, the scheduled batter, Todd Huntley. Huntley, one for two in the game, singled back in the second inning for the Mets' first base hit. That was off of Greg Maddox, who started the game for Atlanta. Huntley also has granted out, so he is one for two.
Braves with a tremendous run in the second part of the season after the acquisition of Fred McGriff from the San Diego Padres to beat out the San Francisco Giants on the last day of the season for the National League Western Division. Now the Braves in the Eastern Division. And that pitcher called strike. Geographically, they basically should be in the Central Division as they are in that Central Division area if you split up the United States and go across the line longitude-wise. But in the Eastern Division with the New York Mets, one of the reasons being they wanted to be in the same division with Miami as they feel they have a natural rivalry with the Florida Marlins. One and one, the count to Todd Huntley. Todd hitting 235 coming into this game. And now they count two and one. Mill Hill on the mound first made the major league for the Cincinnati Reds back in 1991, was in 22 games in relief. I think uh, Pittsburgh was the last team to agree to be in the Central Division. It was either Pittsburgh or Atlanta. They're both. Uh, Pittsburgh's almost due north of Atlanta. Yeah, Atlanta almost might even north. be a little bit west of Pittsburgh if you draw the bit, line. A little bit, but I mean it's it's about the same. I mean from a uh, from that standpoint, they're about the same. And that pitcher ball. So a full count to Todd Huntley. But Pittsburgh was the last team to decide whether to be in the Central Division or not. Central Division, very competitive in the National League this year. Hard ground ball to the second baseman. And Ramon throws over to first base to pick up the out. You have Houston, St. Louis, Chicago, Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh. It's a very competitive division. I think any one uh, of four teams could win it there, either the Cubs, the Cardinals, uh, Cincinnati, or Houston. I mean, even an outside chance, if, if the Pirates get some guys well, Zane Smith, an example of that, Jim Leland uh, could make a run at the other team. And Tim Bogart, the battle, batter, and he takes the first pitch for strike one. Looped out into right field, coming up in the ball of Sarasco. And he puts it away for the out retires the tires aside. So the Mets go in order in their top half of the seventh. And the score at the end, the six and a half inning. Atlanta ate the Mets two, and here's a word from Macy. Well, back here at West Palm Beach, it's Atlanta leading the Mets by a score of eight to two. And a new pitcher in for the New York Mets. Doug Linton pitching a very good two and two-thirds inning and being relieved by Mike Maddox. Maddox is having a good spring, too, his third appearance. He has worked five innings. He's 1-0 and oh, and has given up only one run. So Maddox will be pitching to a pitch hitter, Tyler Houston, batting for the pitcher. So Tyler Houston, the pinch hitter, and Maddox to work here in the bottom half of the seventh inning. And the first pitch is swung on a miss. Here's a new lineup for the New York Mets. Lindemann has taken over in left field. The rest of the outfield the same. Manto has gone into third base. Martinez at short. Zinner at first base. And Fordyce is catching. And the curveball missing the count. One ball and one strike.
two and one to count. Mike Maddox pitching for the Mets. His brother, Greg Maddox, the starting pitcher for Atlanta in this game. And the fastball hit in the air to left field. Lindemann chasing, but ball going out of play. the better part of a year and saw Joe McElvain who's then with the San Diego Padres at a luncheon in Las Vegas in February talked him in to coming to camp with the Padres earned a job and has pitched uh, this is his third year that he'll be pitching since that conversation not only can pitch he can talk and the strikeout sends Tyler Houston back to the bench. Never heard of anybody having lunch in Las Vegas, but I guess it does happen. He lives there. And he that and is also brother. the AAA affiliate of the San Diego Padres. Now it'll be Jose Oliva as the batter. Oliva. 235, 21 home runs, 65 runs batted in in last year's minor league season. Batting for the first time. Replacing Pendleton at third base. Pendleton in this game was one for three and the fastball grounded foul. It has been all Atlanta in this ball game after the third inning. It was tied at two. And then six runs for Atlanta in the fourth to break it open and make it eight to two. So Oliva is out on strikes. Second strike out in a row for Maddox, and that'll bring up Ramon Carabello. Carabello batting for the first time. Good off-speed pitch as Maddox throws it in the perfect position. Caraballo batting for the first time. Taking over at second base. Bounced out to the shortstop side. Quick fielding play to throw the first base in time. And Martinez picks up the out. And for a long time, a good job. By Maddox. The score at the end of seven. Atlanta eight and the Mets two, and we'll return right after this message. New pitch in the ball game for Atlanta. Pedro Bourbon and uh, the first pitch to Rick Parker is taken for ball one. Bourbon and his record. Name sounds familiar, Tim. It should. His father was a right-handed reliever for the Reds back in the late 60s and middle 70s for the Big Red Machine, primarily a middle reliever, but he was a short reliever uh, there for a couple of years, but I guess New York Mets fans would remember him as the guy who prolonged the Buddy Harrelson fight back in 1973 during the league championship series against the Reds. Everybody thought it was over, and when Pete Rose barreled into him, and then Bourbon uh, came from nowhere, the bullpen really, but from nowhere as far as line from, a, from a, Then he picked up a hat and started to eat it, and he found out it was the wrong hat. Didn't like the flavor, spit it out. That was the father of Pedro, who is now pitching for Atlanta. Ball three now, the count three and one. But Harrelson said he gave Pete Rose his best shot. His jaw to Rose's fist. Three and two the count. And the one. 
walk puts the runner at first base. Atlanta leading eight to two. We're in the top half of the eighth inning. And John Cangelosi will be the batter. Cangelosi is 0 for 2 in the game. Mets have been held at three base hits. They got two in the second one. They tied the game at two. And they've had one since an infield hit. And there is the fourth hit of the game for the New York Mets as Cangelosi singles the left field. Parker to second base and holding there. So the Mets with runners at first and second. And that'll bring up Jeff Manto. Jeff batting for the first time. Now in the third base. Mets with four base hits, one of them by Tim Bogar, and he is standing by. And this ball pulled foul down the left field line. And Tim? How you doing? How's everything going? Uh, pretty well. Uh, not too well today, obviously. But, oh, uh, one for three for you isn't too bad. He came in at 3-13. Yeah, it was, uh, it was good to get a uh, base hit with a guy in scoring position. Uh, it gives you a little confidence for the day. They got the Mets' first run in, and Mets did tie it in the second, but then... Things got tough in the fourth. Up the middle and a base hit for Manto. That will score Parker coming in from second base, and the Mets have their third run of the ball game, and still runners at first and second with no one out. Everybody talks about how a pitcher should follow through. A lot of times, even if you follow through, uh, the ball can get back to you in a hurry. Seaboard Bone follows through fine, but the ball right back through the wickets as Jeff Mano drives in the third run of the game. Replacing Tim Bogar, that's about, uh, Timmy, that's about uh, the same place where your hit was, right up the, right back through the originator earlier in the game. Yeah, that's the best way to go. Uh, right back at the pitcher, let him know you're there. Gilby Overis, the batter, he is 0 for 3 in the game. Tim, last year a learning process uh, for you. Uh, any anything that you could uh, tell us? Uh, well, uh, you learned. Yeah, last year, you know, being a rookie, you, you don't get to uh, know the pitchers very well in spring training. You're facing a lot of other guys, and uh, last year I came in late and faced a lot of AAA pitchers. So uh, once I got that starting job, it was a big adjustment for me to learn the pitchers and what they were trying to do to me. A lot of people say that. Uh, something I've, I've never really bought but a lot of people say it's easier to hit in the big leagues because guys are always around the plate <laughs> what's your thought about that thought well i think all those people should go stand up there and see what it's like <laughs> you don't buy it either huh? no it's uh it's not that easy but what what's the biggest difference in your mind between the minor league uh, pitching and the big league pitching well i have i think uh most pitchers can throw all their pitches over for strikes when they need to. Uh, you know, in the minor leagues, you get a lot of, a lot of two-zero, three-one fastballs, and that just doesn't happen up here. And, and uh, you know, basically their control and hitting their spots. It's it's a lot tougher to to hit when you when you know that pitcher can get all four of them over the plate. And this ball grounded down the third base side, knocked down by Oliva and. It'll be a base hit, and the Mets have the bases loaded. So the Mets trying to get back in this ball game. They need five to tie, and they have the bases loaded with no one out in the top of the eighth inning. Usually, when a an infielder goes to his right, he tries to feel the ball and the webbing of the glove. Usually, if it hits the heel of the glove, he's going to drop it heel of the glove like the heel of the hand hard and you can see Oliva going to his right and that ball hit the heel of the glove. Tough play, tough chance, base hit. And the batter is Jim Lindemann and he's batting for the first time. He came in the ball game in left field 
and Lindemann with a 289 year last year and having an excellent spring. Actually, Lindemann led the Pacific Coast League in, in hitting last right. year, 362. Those stats were not exactly representative of his year. Last year's he led the Pacific Coast League in hitting. This spring, he's hitting 529 with nine base hits. He's had a total of five two-base hits, and he has driven in six runs. So he's trying to make the ball club and having an outstanding spring. Telling us before the game that he had not one, not two, but three back operations. And probably the only thing that has kept him out of the big leagues has been his back. Still says it's a day-to-day -day basis. He takes special exercises. And this one grounds at third. It could be a double play. There's one in the dirt and taken out of the dirt by Kelsero. And the double play gives Atlanta two big outs as the Mets get a run. We have seen uh, superb defense by the Atlanta first baseman this afternoon. Two spine stops by Fred McGriff earlier in the game. As you can see, Belliard to Caraballo, and now watch the pick by Klesko. Very fine. As the players, Timmy, you'd say pick it, Wilson, right? That's right. <laughs> Yeah, both their first basemen can uh, use their gloves real well. I've played against Ryan in the uh, minor leagues for quite a while, so he, he knows what he's doing around that bag. This uh, Atlanta club and organization very deep in talent, aren't they, Tim? Yeah, they really are. We play them, uh, I was in AAA with them two years ago, and uh, a lot of their players could have been playing on an expansion team like Miami or somebody else, but uh, it's nice to see some of those guys get a chance now up here. It's almost uh, like the Atlanta Braves, uh, Ralph and Tim, could, could ex expand their roster to 35 guys and have 35 big league players on it. Well, they do have some talent. Of course, they acquired that talent when they were finishing last all those years, getting those first-round draft choices. Then the pitch inside to Alan Zinter, who is batting for the first time. Zinter taking over at first base. Zinner looking for his first hit this spring. He's been up 11 times without a base hit. And that pitch outside for ball three, and it's three and one. And Tim, thank you for coming on for this. Thanks good, for letting me come in. Good, uh, good luck the rest of the spring. We look forward to the year. Tim Bogard joining us in our broadcast. And at the end of seven and a half innings, the Braves eight, the Mets four. And here's a word from Bud Light. Eight to four, Atlanta over the Braves. Bottom of the eighth inning, and new a new pitcher for the New York Mets. Juan Castillo. His record last year at Birmingham, double-A ball, he was 7-11, rather healthy ERA, but 118 strikeouts and 165 and two-thirds innings. And his first pitch is swung on and missed. We have Pat Howell now in center field, and John Cangelosi, who was in center field, has moved over the left with Lindemann out of the ballgame. Javier Lopez, the batter, hitting for the second time, and that's strike two. Lopez grounded out the third his first time up. Lopez deemed to be the starting catcher for the Atlanta Braves, and that pitch hits him on the hand. Ouch. That could be, that could really be serious, but evidently it isn't as he just 
wiggles the fingers and goes on down the first. Well, it couldn't have hit him flush. If you react like this to a fastball thrown about 90 miles an hour, it probably hit the bat and his hand. Let's take another look at it. Yeah, it probably hit the knob of the bat and his hand. Had that ball uh, hit the little finger or the hand, the Braves could be in serious trouble as far as their catching is concerned. Very few hands can stand that, that type of uh, fastball with no place to, to give. And the first pitch to Tony Tarasco is taken for ball one. That's not holding against the runner at first base as Zinter is playing back off the bag. Braves leading eight to four. And that pitch, ball two, two balls and no strikes. with his next delivery and it's popped up. Center fielder Pat Howell with his first chance. One away. Who could forget uh, that catch that Pat Howell made in right center field at Chase Stadium last year. One of the most electrifying catches I have ever seen. Both feet in the in the sponge, the rubber that uh, guards the outfielders protective device that prevents injury from having the outfielder slam into that fence. Sometimes you, uh, I don't think I'll ever be able to look at Pat Howell again without thinking of that catch. Game saver on top of it. Mike Kelly takes the first pitch for strike one. Kelly batting for the second time, struck out his first time up. And the breaking ball and inside, one ball and one strike. Pete Jury started the game for the Mets, had a tough time in the fourth inning when he gave up six runs on six hits. He'll be the losing pitcher if the game continues this way. And Greg Maddox, the Cy Young Award winner the past two years in the National League, on the winning side. Maddox working four innings, gave up two runs, allowed two hits, struck out one and walked two. Ball puts the count at one ball and two strikes. Mike Kelly hits against Juan Castillo. Braves so far this spring, where well, the record is six and five. The Mets came into this game with a record of eight and five. That that been riding a winning crest as they had won seven in a row and eight of their last ten. Ground ball to the third base side. Jeff Manto over to second in time to throw way wide and into the photographer's area there. And no double play. And there will be an air charge on the second baseman as that ball going into that photographer's area is out of play. Mets with four errors on the afternoon. Ber Barris tries to make the pivot, but he throws it into the photographer's booth along the first base line. And, and the, even though there is no barrier up there, there is a line that is drawn around and clearly uh, out of play, so a throwing error on Barrett. Might even be the Mason-Dixon line, but the batter will be Raphael Belliard, batting for the second time, and he grounds out his first time and fouls this one off, so strike one. Braves scored two in the first, the Mets tied it with two runs in the bottom, make that the top half of the second, and then the Braves six in the fourth inning. Mets coming back, picking up two runs in the eighth. Castillo's impressive if he throws strikes. He's 6'5", 210 pounds from Caracas, Venezuela. 
ton of talent to come out of that uh, area. Caracas, Venezuela. Hall of Famer. And a guy who is revered down there, Luis Aparicio. Probably could uh, be the president of that country if he ran for it. Now that was a no swing as Villiard did hold up in time in the count. One ball and two strikes. Villiard. He didn't go. Held up in time. And it's up the middle. Cut off by Martinez and the throw to first base for the out. Good play by Pablo Martinez to end the inning. One air and one man left on the score at the end of eight. It's Atlanta eight, the Mets four, and now here's a word from Snapple. Well, the Braves leading eight to four, last chance for the Mets, top of the ninth inning, and Mark Roller, Roller is the new pitcher. One of the most sought after young pitchers in the game. Braves do not feel that he has reached the stage where he can be the number one closer. I think he can. I think if he had a little more confidence, I think the Braves could have saved themselves a lot of money. They went out and hired Greg Olson, the fine pitcher with the Baltimore Orioles for years. But, uh, but Greg, who had his first outing two days ago, uh, bothered by arm problems the last, last year, I'll tell you, this guy can blow. He has been clocked at 100 miles an hour. He can throw the ball extremely hard. And he's working to Pablo Martinez, who is batting for the first time. Mets trailing by four in their last at bat. And this ball hit in the air to left field. Troy Hughes, the left fielder. And the Mets lose one of their last three outs. And that will bring up Brooke Fordyce. Brooke batting for the first time. And the first pitch is ball one. Fordyce, 259, two home runs last year. That's ball two, two balls and no strikes. Bowlers in the minor legs average a strikeout an inning, which is considered to be extremely good. In the major leagues, he has not reached that, but he has been a strikeout pitcher with that fine fastball. His problem, of course, relief. Did a fine job in relief last year after starting the season at Richmond and being brought up by the Braves and used in relief. Gets a strike there and it's three and one. Three one pitch and this hit in the air to center, deep center field. Going back is Mike Kelly and he goes to the warning track and he makes the catch. So Kelly making a fine play in center, and the Mets are down to their last out. Well, the Braves have been talking about Mike Kelly and how much ground he covers in center field. Boy, did he ever uh, make that look easy. Digging up a couple of uh, feet of turf in the process. Gliding back, and it looks like he slipped, and then the knees dislodge a bit of the turf near the track. Mike appears to be all right. Fine play by Mike Kelly. And that will bring up Pat Howell, and he's batting for the first time. And Howell thinks about Bunning, takes for ball one. Mets need more than one base runner. They need a few as they trail by four in their last at bat in the ninth inning, two men away. They've been out hit 10 to six. And this one grounded to second base, and that should do it. Caraballo makes the play, and that's the ball game. So the Atlanta Braves win it. 
by a score of eight to four. The winning pitch in the game was Greg Maddox, who worked the first four innings. Gave up two runs on two hits, struck out one, and walked two. The losing pitcher, Pete Shurik, he worked three in the third, gave up seven runs on eight hits, struck out one, and walked one. And the Braves with six runs in the fourth inning, sending ten men to the plate, breaking the 2-2 tie, and then holding on the winners. The Mets got two runs in the eighth inning. See, Ralph, even in spring training, you've got to do something, all right? See, the, the Braves are all lined up, and they're working on their handshakes after victory. That's a very important part of this program. Very, program. very important part. Lined up and shaking hands. I think these guys are going to be shaking hands a lot this year. Uh, they're good. Ending team, no doubt about it. And the Braves winning by a score of 8-4. to four. And we'll be back with a wrap right after this word from Coca-Cola. Well, the Atlanta Braves win it by a score of 8-4. to four. The big news here in West Palm Beach, the fact that the Atlanta Braves have asked waivers to release Ron Gant, who has been an outstanding defensive player and offensive player for the Atlanta Braves. They had a press conference before the ball game, and uh, the announcement was made that he will be released. And uh, the ramifications stem on that will certainly be interesting to follow as a uh, measure of trying to uh, change their ball club around. Gant, of course, if you haven't heard, broke his leg in two places riding a dirt bike motorcycle and will not be available this year for play until sometime in the middle of the summer. And the Braves figuring they could not sign him after this year, his last year on his contract. And so they have gone ahead and released him at this point. Uh, who, be who better to answer some of these uh, questions concerning uh, uh, contracts and disputes uh, with uh, the Players Association and uh, I'm sure there will be but Eddie Lynch who is the assistant general manager of the Mets uh, Ed welcome uh, to our uh, show and can you shed a little light uh, about some of the things that uh, we may not know about as far as the Gantt situation is concerned well Tim they have a few options that they can exercise here uh, number one they could try to void his contract totally and not pay him anything uh, they could pay him one-sixth of his salary. Uh, that's why he was released today, to give them that option. They could pay him one-fourth of his salary, or they could pay him his whole salary. So until they really decide what they are going to pay him in terms of his contract uh, terms, that's when the controversy will begin. Well, Ed, of course, the, the big part of that is when you say pay his salary or one-sixth or one-fourth or whatever, we're talking about millions of dollars. They will have to pay him if they play one-sixth something like uh, $960,000 for not even being here in camp. And uh, if they don't pay him at all, of course, nothing. But if they have to pay him his full salary, it would be up around $5, $5 million. Yeah, well, it's a tough situation. I think the one point that everybody probably agrees on, that it's, it's really a shame what happened. I'm sure Ron Gant and John Scherholz and everybody in their organization is upset about what happened. Nobody could ever want something like this to happen. And it's an unfortunate incident. And... You know, whatever they do is going to be controversial, but uh, again, it's it's an impossible situation for everybody involved. Ed, with that, without divulging anything about the uh, contracts of the New York Met players, uh, uh, just generally speaking, what about the language of the contracts that that try to deter? players from doing dangerous uh, activities uh, during the offseason. Well, there is a clause. Uh, Tim, you, we talked earlier about uh, uh -huh. Jim Longborg and the skiing. I remember he was injured after his Cy Young year, and a Jim Longborg clause was put in the contracts about skiing. And there is a clause in every uniform player's contract in terms of, I think they call it games is the name of the paragraph. And mm -hmm. they, you know, they prohibit uh, players without the express written consent of the club from doing auto racing and uh, skiing and skydiving and motorcycle racing. So, I mean, it is in the contract, but again, uh, you know, if you're riding a motorcycle or you're racing, so it, again, this is something that's going to be, they're going to be fighting out on the meaning of words, and that's usually how most dis disputes uh, happen. You know, Jim Palmer, a great pitcher for the Baltimore Orioles, uh, went to Frank Cashin, who was the general manager of the Orioles at one time, and uh, at one, he said, I'd like to play uh, tennis uh, in, during the winters that are with the ball club. And Cashin said, no way. He says, you're a right-handed pitcher. You played tennis. You might hurt that arm. You're a Cy Young Award winner. You're a great pitcher. You cannot play. And Jim Palmer said, well, if I play left-handed, can I do it? And Frank Cashin said, yes, you can do it if you serve and play left-handed. And he did play left-handed and became a great tennis player. 
Well, you know, it's a, it's a 12 month a year job now, especially when you're getting the money of some of these guys are getting paid. Uh, if you're making $5 million, uh, you've got to be careful. You have a responsibility not only to yourself, but to uh, everybody involved to, to be prudent and be careful about what you do. You know, accidents do happen, and they're certainly tragic, and it's nobody's fault. I think we all agree on that. Mm -hmm. But again, when you're dealing with these kind of dollars, it is a tough situation. Uh, how about Jay Stadium? Is Pete Flynn uh, digging all the ice and getting all the snow and getting, getting it ready for opening day on April 11th? Well, all I know is the last time I was there, they were ice skating on the infield, some of the ticket office people. and uh... Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding <laughs> returning, huh? Yeah, so, but I'm sure I hear the weather's getting a little better, and... Uh, you know, we'll be ready for opening day, and you're, people are going to see a lot of different changes in Shea Stadium. We've really done our best to uh, clean it up and, and make it a, a more friendly place for fans with banners and uh, ushers' uniforms. So everybody will see a, a pronounced difference in the atmosphere at Shea Stadium coming opening day. And, of course, the Mets hope that it will be a pronounced difference when it comes to the results on the ball field. And, uh, Ed, they've looked, uh, I think, very good this spring. Things are working out very nicely. Of course, there are a lot of puzzles to that jigsaw that the Mets have down there, where to play whom and who can play and what will you, but I would have to think Dallas Green is very happy with what he's seen so far in this trans transformation period. Yeah, outside of today, we played extremely well the last week, the 10 days. We've been scoring runs. Our pitching has been good. You know, we said all along the key to our ball club is Dwight Gooden, Brett Saberhagen, and John Franco. If they have the years that they've had in the past, not career years, but just an average year for them, we're going to be that much better. And Saberhagen is throwing very well. John Franco threw outstanding the other day. So we're excited about uh, the pitching. And we're getting some offense, too. Bobby Benilla swinging the bat. Some of the non-roster guys, Jim Lindemann, John Candelosi, are doing very well. So, you know, we're right on track. We feel good. We've been playing good lately. And when you lose 103 games, it's important to win in spring training because you have to relearn how to win and re, uh, relearn how to win and be in the game every day. So we definitely want to win these spring training games because, you know, when you lose 103 games, wins are important. Eddie, uh, we can't let you go uh, without asking you uh, what you can tell us about Brett Saberhagen and the, and the, uh, the possibility of him being traded before opening day. Well, we said all along from day one is that we are not shopping Brett Saberhagen. That is untrue to say that we're out actively shopping. Uh, what we are doing, we are listening. We are in the listening business. We lost 103 games. We can't sit on our laurels. We're not the Toronto Blue Jays, so we have to go out and make this club better. And there's only three ways to make your club better, through trades, through free agents signing in the draft, and uh, through free agents, uh, uh, in, you know, six-year free agents. Mm -hmm. So uh, we didn't sign a six-year free agent uh, over the winter. We didn't uh, sign an A or B free agent. Uh, the draft is coming up, so the only avenue we have now is trade. So, you know, again, we said Brett Saberhagen is a quality pitcher, a quality person. We'd love for him to be here all year, win 20 games. We certainly feel he's going to. But again, we're in the listening business. If we can do something to help the organization, I think Brett understands that we're going to do it. And uh, it's nothing to do with whether we like him or not. We like him as a person. But again, we're not shopping him, but we're going to listen to uh, whatever offers come across Joe's desk. Well, that sounds like the Mets are still in business, and the Mets certainly not liking the business they had to do today as they lost to the Atlanta Braves by a score of 8-4. to four. We'll be back with more right after this word from Bell Atlantic Yellow Pages.